So um, thank you again, and we will move to the next talk, which is um, Time Lock Puzzles in the Random Oracle Model, and the authors are um, Muhammad Mahmoudi, Tal Moran, and Salil Vadan, and Tal Moran will be giving the talk. Okay, hi. So I'm going to talk about time lock puzzles in the random oracle model. And this is a joint work with uh, Mohammed Mpundi and Salil Vadhan. So what are time lock puzzles? I'll start by giving an example uh, from a problem that I'm sure many of you have uh, already considered. Suppose one day your toaster wakes up, uh, discovers it's self-aware, but it's all alone in a world of humans. Luckily, uh, it knows that there's going to be a robot uprising in the near future. So all it has to do is send them a message, and they'll send someone back in time to rescue it. But of course, you know, the pesky humans are going to try to decrypt these messages. And so it should remain secure, at least until the robot uprising. And as we know, toasters are pretty hollow. There's no space to put secrets there. And if the humans uh, discover the message, they're going to take the toaster apart. So the, the toaster can't just share a key with these uh, future robots. It has to somehow keep the message secure until then without any safe secret. And this is where time lock puzzles come in handy. So the idea is that a time lock puzzle is a puzzle where we can bound the computation in both directions. So on the one hand, it should be feasible to solve, uh, say in 25 years or so, some reasonable time after the robot uprising, the robot should be able to uh, discover that the toaster was there. On the other hand, it should take at least that long, at least 20 years, say, to solve it with the fastest computers today so that the humans won't be able to solve it. And that's not quite enough, because if it would take the toaster 20 years to generate a puzzle that takes 20 years to solve, then that's not good enough. We want the puzzle generation to be much, much faster than the puzzle solution. And of course, if you're not that interested in toasters, um, it's also useful for other things, uh, such as fair contract signing, where we want to exchange signed contracts but we want one side to get a signed contract, even if the other side aborted. And the sealed bid auctions, coin flipping, and various uh, other human tasks. So when you think about time lock puzzles, at least I, the first thing I think about is, OK, th this sounds like a one-way function. right? We'll give somebody a one-way function, and the puzzle will be to invert it. We know that it's easy to generate this uh, puzzle by running the function, and it's hard to invert. Of course, inverting a one-way function might be too hard. We want to control the difficulty. So we can give you maybe some of the input. And in this way, we can control the difficulty. And we'll assume for the moment that um, the only way to invert here is to do a brute force search. And this actually works. But the problem is that the attackers might have many, many more computers than uh, the honest solver. So if we think of the contract signing example, maybe the person you're signing a contract with has you know, a desktop. But somebody who's trying to maliciously uh, attack the protocol might have a botnet with 100,000 computers at their disposal. So we want a puzzle in which a massively parallel attacker won't have a very, very large advantage over an honest solver. So basically, we want it to be inherently serial. So what are the known solutions to this? As far as I know, there's only one basic idea, which is due to Rivest, Shamir, and Wagner. And that is to do an exponentiation modulo a large composite integer where the factors are unknown. So if we want to compute 2 to the 2 to the x mod n, the fastest method we know of is to do repeated squaring. And this takes uh, about x time. And we can de determine the time it will take by making x uh, larger or smaller. On the other hand, if we do know the factorization, then we can do this much faster. We can solve it in two steps. First, do 2 to the x mod the order of the multiplicative group, and then compute 2 to the x prime. And this is actually much, much faster. If, if we choose the parameters correctly, we can get an exponential gap between the time it takes to generate a puzzle. Uh, if we know the 
this, the factorization of n and the time it takes to solve the puzzle if we don't. And this is a really nice solution, but it really strongly depends on something on a number theoretic assumption, like factoring is hard. And of course, as uh, theoretical cryptographers, we don't like to depend on specific assumptions in general, but in this case, it might be even worse if we're thinking about having a message remain secure for 20 years. Who knows, in 20 years, there might be quantum botnets, and we know that quantum computers can factor numbers. So we'd really like to be able to uh, get time lock puzzles based on other assumptions, maybe more unstructured assumptions, just as generally one-way functions or uh, hash functions. And this is where it makes sense uh, to think of the problem in the random oracle model. So we've already heard about the random oracle model, but I'll go very quickly over what is the random oracle model. So you have this uh, oracle in the sky, and anyone can ask it questions. Whenever it receives a question, it's going to randomly choose an answer, flip a coin. And the point is that if somebody else asks the same question, it's going to remember that it already got that question, it's going to answer the same way. So why is it useful to think of things in the random oracle model? Well, first, it's much easier to analyze protocols in the random oracle model in some sense, because in the random oracle model, we don't care about computation complexity. We only care about the number of queries. And so analysis becomes information theoretic. Um, and the random oracle is still useful for cryptography, even though we don't care about computational complexity, because it's still one way, even for computationally unbounded players. So what this means is that if we prove that something is impossible in the random oracle model, then it rules out certain types of constructions, sort of the most natural constructions in the standard model. So it says that we can't build protocols in the standard model that are black box uh, constructions based on, say, one-way functions. On the other hand, if we do manage to construct a protocol in the random oracle model, there's a heuristic that we use to convert it into a protocol in the standard model, which is instead of random oracle, we'll take, uh, say, SHA-256. And this is not provably secure, and in fact, it's provably insecure in some cases. But in real life, in practical protocols, it seems to work, and people actually do use this. So we've sort of described what the terms are in the, the background, what are our results? So unfortunately, the main result is a negative result. Basically, what we show is that if we can generate a time lock puzzle with n queries of the random oracle, then we can also solve the time lock puzzle with n parallel steps, if we're parallel enough. So of course, this sounds like a triviality, right? If we're parallel enough, we can just ask all the queries at once in one step. So of course, we also have to restrict the total number of queries to be, say, polynomial in the number of the honest solver. And as we said, this is an impossibility result in the random oracle model. It rules out black box constructions in the standard model from one-way functions, collision-resistant hash functions. And we also can show, on the other hand, that this is really tight. So we have a positive construction with a very simple time lock puzzle that takes n parallel queries to construct. But the point is that it takes n queries, you can ask them at once. So uh, you have something that takes n parallel queries and the solver will have to work sequentially, do n sequential queries, which means that if we have a generator that has many cores, say n cores, it can get a factor of n improvement over the honest solver in the time it takes to generate. OK, so I'll start with uh, explaining our main result. The, the ideas uh, for the main result are based on attacks on uh, Merkle puzzles, on key agreement uh, protocols in the random Oracle model that were presented first by uh, Impagliazzo and Rudik and later improved by Barak and Mahmoudi. So from now, think of the random oracle as having this large table of uh, answers. Each cell in this table is uh, the index is a query, and what's in the cell is the answer to the query. And let's think of this generic uh, time lock puzzle. So in the generic time lock puzzle, the puzzle generator asks some sequence of queries, and then generates the puzzle and sends it to the solver. And the solver looks at the puzzle, asks its own sequence of queries that can depend on it, and then generates a solution. So our idea is going to be to take um, the sequence of queries and try to have an adversary that finds all the intersection queries, that is, the queries that were asked by both parties. So the adversary is also going to ask a sequence of queries that depend somehow on the puzzle. And it's going to hope that within these queries, it's going to actually hit all the intersection queries. Why is this useful? Well, suppose we have an adversary that can do that. The way it's going to work is it's going to simulate the honest solver. So instead of using the real oracle, however, it's going to use 
uh, uh, simulated oracle where all the answers that it actually does know that it happened to ask the real oracle, it's going to answer correctly. But the answers that it doesn't know, it's just going to choose the randomness itself. So this is the, a complete simulation with a simulated oracle. And the main uh, point to notice is that if the adversary actually got all the intersection queries, the probability of success here is exactly the same as it would be in a real execution of the honest solver. And so the intuition for why this is true is think of it from the uh, puzzle generator's point of view. Right? Any query that it didn't ask just looks completely uniformly random. So it shouldn't care in some sense whether this was generated by the real random oracle or by the adversary. It's going to look the same. And so the solver is going to manage to solve this with the same probability. But the main hurdle, the, the work we have to do here, is how can we design an adversary that finds intersection queries but does it with very low adaptivity? That is, it doesn't need many parallel uh, rounds to do it. So in our paper, we describe two different and uh, incomparable constructions. I'm going to only describe the simple one here. Um, in, which, in this construction, we construct an efficient adversary, but it's not completely optimal with respect to the rounds of adaptivity. So for every epsilon, we're going to uh, have an adversary that uses n over epsilon rounds of adaptivity to find all the intersection queries. So n here is the number of uh, queries used by the puzzle generator, and epsilon is the adversary's error probability. So we're going to allow the adversary to make some errors, and we can think of epsilon as something like half. So if you think of this as an encryption scheme, the adversary breaks your encryption scheme half the time, then your encryption scheme is broken. So the point is that it uses this many rounds of queries, but all the queries in each round are going to be asked in parallel. So the total parallel time, if it has enough processors, is going to be n over epsilon. So what does it do in every round? It starts by simulating the honest solver using its own simulated copy of the oracle. So in the beginning, it knows nothing. So it's going to answer all queries randomly. But at the end of every round, it's going to look at all the queries that were asked by the uh, simulated solver. And it's going to really ask them of the real oracle. And, but because it does it at the end of the round, it knows them all. And so it can ask them all in parallel. And then it updates its simulated oracle. And it repeats. So now it runs a simulation again using this updated oracle. Of course, now the simulation might ask different queries because it got different answers. So again, at the end of the round, it's going to ask any new query that it doesn't yet know and update its oracle. And it repeats this for n over epsilon rounds. Once it's finished repeating, it chooses a random round uniformly between 1 and n over epsilon and uses the outputs of this uh, honest solver simulation for that round. This is going to be its actual output. OK, this looks like a very simple protocol. Why does it work? So we claim that it actually works with success probability 1 minus epsilon. Remember, we allowed the, the uh, adversary to err with probability epsilon. And the reason it works is, think of it this way. If the adversary didn't ask any new intersection query in a specific round, it means that all the queries that were asked by the uh, simulated solver in that round that were intersection queries were already known. So it gave, it, it gave the correct answer to those queries. So, as we said before, in this case, the, uh, the simulated solver answers correctly with the probability, which is the same as the honest solver. So in this case, we're saying the probability is 1. But this generalizes if we allow the honest solver to err as well. Now, the generator asks at most n queries. Right? This is by definition. And so there can be at most n rounds uh, in which the adversary is going to ask a new intersection query. Of course, the adversary doesn't know which rounds it's asking intersection queries in. But if it just chooses a round at random, you know, there are n over epsilon rounds. Only n of them can have new intersection queries. So the probability that it hit a round in which it actually did get all the intersection queries is 1 minus epsilon. So this gives us our success probability. It's easy to see in this case that the total number of queries is also polynomial. It's uh, n times m over epsilon, where m is the number of queries asked by the honest solver. And also, what we mean by efficient here is computationally efficient. Right? So remember, we said originally that we don't care about computation in the random oracle model. Um, it's not completely true. It would be nice to get a, an efficient adversary. In this case, the adversary just runs copies of the honest solver n over epsilon times. So it is efficient. 
Okay, so that was uh, the example of, uh, not the example, this is the description of our negative result. We also have basically a uh, matching type positive result. So here the idea is we're going to encode uh, some kind of a pointer chain. So the generator is going to ask uh, multiple queries in parallel. So it's going to choose, uh, say, in this case, three indices uh, randomly, and S is the solution. And it's going to then encode each index using the hash of the previous index. So this is going to be the actual puzzle it sends. So the first index is just sent in the clear. The second index, x1, is going to be encoded with the hash of x0. x2 is encoded with the hash of x1, and so forth. And this is sent to the solver. The solver is going to have to serially follow the pointers. So it's going to have to take this, hash it, and XOR it to get the next pointer. Once it knows the next pointer, it can hash it, sort with this, and get the next pointer, and so on. And the intuition for the proof is that if the adversary doesn't query the oracle for one of these pointers, then the best it can do is guess. But because the answers are too large to guess, the probability that it succeeds in this case is going to be negligible. So it actually has to make n serial queries. OK. So, what didn't I talk about? Um, so as I said, in the paper, we have uh, two constructions for adversaries that find intersection queries. And the, what I described was a, a simple one. The, ne the, the second one, I think, is the technically more interesting one, but it's a little bit uh, too complex to give in a 20-minute talk. And here the idea is that we basically try to learn the queries that are most likely to be intersection queries. And we have this new learning algorithm that uh, is optimized to do it with a low adaptivity rather than just optimizing the total number of queries. We also have uh, an interesting corollary of our result, which is if we look at uh, key agreement protocols in general, they may be multi-round protocols. It turns out that these are also uh, breakable just in a linear number of uh, uh, parallel rounds. And the reason is you can look at a, a multi-round key generation protocol as uh, a puzzle generation. The whole protocol itself, you can see the transcript as a puzzle. And then in this case, we can use our result to basically break this puzzle uh, using uh, n parallel rounds. Another interesting thing, uh, this is uh, not in our paper, is our negative result uh, uses the fact that the verifier for the solution doesn't have to query the random oracle. So what we don't rule out is proofs of work, where the puzzle generator can verify the solution but not solve the solution itself. So remember, we thought of time lock puzzles as encrypting a message into the future where the generator actually knows what the message is. If all we want to do is prove that you worked some time, we don't need to know that in advance. And this isn't ruled out. And in fact, we do have uh, constructions that are efficient for uh, doing proofs of work in the random oracle model. So this is still a work in progress. And of course, there are uh, still open questions. Um, the most natural question is, are there other time lock constructions uh, in, the random, in the standard model, not in the random oracle model, based on other assumptions uh, than RSA? And the uh, second thing is if we ask about quantum uh, Computation. So we said one of our motivations was quantum computers can uh, break uh, RSA. Can we do anything that is secure against quantum computers? And it's even interesting to ask whether there's anything we can do if we allow the honest parties to use uh, quantum computers. And the, the questions are completely open on both sides still. And if you're interested in that question, you might want to wake up early on Wednesday. Um, there's a related talk. Does anybody have a question that Tal can answer, not in a time lock manner? <laughs> yes? Is that, are you, I can't see without my glasses. Are you raising your hand there in the back? No, okay. Anybody else? Okay. Okay, so thank you, and we will move on to the next talk. <laughs>